Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream on History Vibe Podcast. And today, my guest is Professor Dennis McDonald. He returns to History Vibe Podcast to have another discussion based upon his book, Must the Synoptics Remain a Problem? If you want to get the book, check out the History Valley Amazon affiliate link in the description below. And that being said, welcome back to History Vibe. Uh, welcome back to History Vibe Podcast, Dennis. Well, thank you, Jacob. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, let me say uh, one thing about the accessibility of my books on Amazon. Sure. Um, if you go to Dennis R. McDonald, you will not find my books. You used to be able to. The only way to get the synopsis, and I'm going to have to correct this with Amazon, the only way to get the synopses of Epic Tragedy in the Gospels, which is the earlier book, you have to do it by title. You cannot do it by my name. If you do it by Dennis MacDonald, you will get Must the Synoptics Remain a Problem, but you won't get it if you go to Dennis R. MacDonald. So um, if you want to try to get the synopsis of Epic uh, Tragedy in the Gospels, um, you have to do it by title. Um, if you want to get Must the Synoptics Remain a Problem, you need to go to Dennis MacDonald. Uh, I'm going to try to correct this this weekend. I just noticed the problem, but um, it's uh, unfortunately it's not very easy to get these books, and Amazon uh, is the only commercial distributor. So I'd like to take us uh, right here. Can you discuss the five defensive strategies used by scientists to fend off um, threats by pesky unanticipated anomalies? Sure. Um, and these are strategies that um, appear in science, but also in gospel scholarship to suppress inconvenient truths. Um, one thing one can do is just to deny them. Um, in the case of New Testament scholarship, literary parallels between Greek poetry and the gospel simply do not exist according to this view. Carl Olaf Sandness, for example, insists that the evangelists and the readers were insufficiently literate for strategic and hermeneutically freighted imitations to be meaningful. If one accepts Sandness's dictum, it matters not how many parallels one draws between classical Greek poetry and the Gospels, how sequential they are, or how distinctive, mimesis becomes impossible at moot and its practitioners mute. Another thing to do is suppression. Since these literary parallels do not exist, one may safely ignore and silence those who claim that they do. Accommodation. Well, even if such parallels do exist, they are not mimetically intertextual, but dynamically intercultural. M. David Litwa says, if imitation occurred, it did not occur in the bookish fashion. There were many more common ways for people in antiquity to absorb and adapt cultural lore. Traditional historical criticism thus will suffice. Well, it won't suffice to explain all of them, but uh, Litwa is right that um, imitation can happen uh, in ways that are not just bookish. Then methodological assaults. Even if such parallels were intertextually mimetic, no criteria can demonstrate it. Again, Litwa, no amount of similarity between texts can prove a genetic connection. Well, if not, what would? Uh, this is an attempt to um, pull the rug out of any mimetic connection, uh, with, uh, including with Jewish texts. Marginalization. Okay, even if one occasionally were to demonstrate that a parallel with classical Greek poetry was mimetic, it's nothing more than an insignificant blip on the radar. Many critical reviews conclude with such a dismissal, even after admitting an occasional example. So, phew, um, the matrix survives largely unscathed. So this is the way that uh, scientists, uh, biblical scholars too, handle uh, inconvenient truths, to deny them, to suppress them, 
in some cases to accommodate them to uh, the science that's already there, to attack the uh, methodologies that are used to interpret those inconvenient facts, and even if you accept them, to marginalize them. So in this uh, next page, I articulate how that works um, in a counter argument. The Homeric epics were the most popular models for narrative composition in the early Roman Empire. One catalog of manuscripts from Greco-Roman Egypt from about 200 BCE to 200 CE lists 604 of Homer, not including commentaries in Scolia. In a distant second place comes Demosthenes with 83, then Euripides with 77, Hesiod with 72, and Plato with 42. Only five issue from the Septuagint and Old Greek. At stake here is the saturation of um, the satisfaction of criterion one of Mimesis criticism, accessibility. The second is Mimesis stood at the center of literary education and production. Quote, the dominant notion in the literary aesthetic among Greek intellectuals in the Greek, early Greek uh, Roman Empire was Mimesis, or Philodemus, who is a rhetorician, who would claim that the writing of prose is not reliant on the Homeric poems. At stake here is the satisfaction of criterion two of Mimesis criticism, analogy. Authors of prose at the time often imitated Homeric epics. Then, the Gospels and Acts are populated by analogs to Homeric characters and episodes that are so profuse, sequential, and unusual that they must not be ignored. At stake here is the satisfaction of criteria three to five, density, order, and distinctive traits. The extent and specificity of gospel parallels to Homer's works demands an explanation of some kind. And then imitations of classical Greek literature also are interpretable. In many ancient narratives, mimesis enabled constructing one's own self-representation through and against the canonical past. And then finally, by resisting, uh, by resisting mimesis criticism, the disciplinary matrix we call New Testament scholarship has turned a blind eye to one of the most important and fascinating aspects of the gospel composition. So that's the way I start um, the, the book, uh, Must the Synoptics Remain a Problem? And my answer is no, it needn't remain a problem, but the two steps that are necessary to solve it are unwelcome by almost all uh, gospel scholars. And those two um, criteria are a recognition of Homeric influence on the gospels, and second, a recognition that Mark is suffused with parallels to the Q document, and is in fact a per, our earliest and perhaps is our most important witness to it. So there you have the argument of the book, and I spend a, a lot of the book trying to make sense of it or to, to uh, explore it. So basically what you're talking about is, is what some would call the Mark Q overlaps, but you right. see a lot more Mark Q overlaps than others might see, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to shift now to talking about the, and you also talk about this uh, in, in the book, the different um, solutions offered to solve the synoptic problem. We got the two source theory in the left there, the grist back in the middle, um, and we got Mark and John using a hypothetical proto-gospel as a source. Let me just fix that right there. There we go. Um, so we well, about, thank, you. thank you for these charts. Of these charts, Mark is the only one, uh, the first one on the left is the only one that really makes sense. Because you'll notice that Mark in the middle is the, at, the at the end of the synoptic tradition and um, is competitive with John on the right-hand side. But Mark is the one who initiates Homeric imitations um, in an aggressive way 
in the gospel tradition. And so he has to become, he has to come first. Um, and then uh, the other gospels um, often uh, don't either, either don't see those imitations or try to uh, mollify them in some way. The same is true for the uh, Marcionite gospel, the so-called Marcion gospel, um, because it wants to say that Marcion's gospel is earlier than the other gospels. And um, so, yes, there you have it. Uh, so on the left-hand column, you have the Evangelion, that is the gospel according to Marcion, that is an earlier version than the Gospel of Luke. But Luke has lots of Homeric imitations and other poetic imitations as well that are missing in the Evangelion of Marcion. So if you try to do that, then you have to have two stages of um, Homeric imitation inside of Luke, not even talking about Mark. So it's much easier to explain um, the priority of Luke to Marcion's gospel and saying that Marcion just didn't like or whatever reason didn't include some of the passages in Luke that are um, that are imitations of uh, Greek poetry. So there are a few scholars who are trying to merge um, Marcion's priority and um, Homeric uh, imitations in Luke and Mark, but um, they are so forced and implausible that I really don't think they have any traction. And now I would like to take a look at some of the uh, material, the additional material you go over regarding Marcion and Luke. Um, before we do that, uh, you have this diagram in the book of Homer, Mark, Logion, John. Could you talk about that? Um, sure. The way to uh, see it is by the columns. You have the Homeric passage on the left. You have the Markan uh, version in then the, the chapter verse numbers, a description of the Logion. And then in the next column, John, you can forget about the other two columns. The issue here is that Mark and John, as you can see in this diagram, share lots of content. In every case, you have a parallel in the Homeric epics, and in every case, without exception, Mark is more primitive. So um, if John and Mark are getting this from another source, the source has to be almost identical to Mark, in order to make sense of what John's doing. So the author of the fourth gospel, it's actually three authors probably, authors of the, of the uh, fourth gospel, the gospel of John, is using Mark and is um, giving his own version of what Mark has derived from the Homeric epics. And now you, um, you talk about Marcion's Luke, Chronicle Luke, um, what's absent in Marcion's Luke, and what's in Chronicle Luke. Okay, this chart is uh, even trickier to manage. You have this arranged according to how advocates for the priority of Marcion's Luke would like it. That is, Marcion's Luke comes first, then Canonical Luke. And then we have a description of what that login is. And then on the right-hand side, you have what the Homeric, uh, in this case, the, uh, the poetic model is in the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite. So you'll see that it begins with an absence. There's no enunciation to Zechariah. There's no enunciation to Mary. So in this case, canonical Luke has to be the one who's imitating the poetry. Let's go to the next page. The same thing continues. There's no angelic announcement to the shepherds in, the, in Marcion's gospel. 
there's no baptism or temptation story in Marcion's gospel, but we have parallels to those in Greek poetry. If you'll drop down about 10 items, you'll see that you don't have in Marcion's gospel a triumphal entry, a lamentation for Jerusalem, um, the parable of the wicked vine dressers, or the hacking of the ear of Judas. All of those have Homeric or Euripidean parallels. So you'd have to say that according to this model, um, the, the Marcion's gospel imitated Greek poetry. Luke came along and it added to Marcion's gospel other examples of imitations of Greek poetry. Um, but that is a bulky way to understand it. If you'll drop down to um, the next chart. Let me see if that's on the next slide. There we go. Yeah, there you go. This is how the um, tradition is going to work. You have the Gospel of Mark, who, and by the way, this chart continues for the next page, but don't worry about it yet. So the Gospel of Mark has lots of stories that have parallels in Greek poetry. Canonical Luke recognizes that and includes those stories and adds uh, some um, poetry uh, imitations of his own. Marcion comes along and he doesn't like a bunch of them. And so he gets rid of them. And in no case is Marcion's uh, gospel closer to the mimetic model uh, or even to Mark. So, um, and you can uh, get to the next page too and you'll see this phenomenon continues. Well, I guess it, <laughs> I guess it doesn't. I guess we, uh, we exhausted it. In any case, uh, it's much easier to say that uh, Mark is the first gospel who is imitating extensively Homeric uh, texts. Luke comes along and he adds to that. And Marcion likes some of them, doesn't like others, but is never more primitive to the um, poetic model than Mark or canonical Luke. Now, I know this is complex, but this is why the synoptic problem hasn't been solved in so long. So I'm going to leave this chart on the screen just for a second. Um, okay. I can get the next chart in here just one moment. Um, so basically what, what I'll ask you for now while we wait on that is um, basically what you're saying is uh, Mar in Marcion's gospel, the a lot of the Homeric parallels uh, between Homer and Luke are removed. Well, that's one of the arguments. That's right. So um, you would have to say if Marcion comes first that Luke added them. And why do you think Marcion removed that material? Um, oh, I think that that's pretty clear. Although to some extent, uh, scholars have um, have wondered about it. Um, the infancy narratives in the Gospel of Luke are um, replete with allusions to the uh, Jewish scriptures. And the Marcion's uh, tradition, and not just Marcion himself, um, wants to say that the God of Jesus is not the God of the Jewish Bible. And so these connections to um, the, the Jewish Bible are an embarrassment and an inconvenient fact for Marcionites. So they're going to get rid of them. Um, that doesn't explain for all of the omissions, but I think it uh, it's, allows for an understanding of many of them. All right, so I'm going to bring the slideshow back. Up oh, on a second. Here we go. 
there's the rest of it that you were talking about. Yeah, that's right. So the absent vine dressers is missing the hacking of the year, and they have parallels in um, uh, in um, the Homeric epics. Uh, by the way, <laughs> Jacob, not to nitpick, but the, the way this uh, live stream was advertised, it used the word ripping off the Homeric epics. Uh, I would rather say it's riffing off the Homeric epics. Hmm. Mimesis is in, th is in theft. Mimesis is uh, critical cultural engagement. So, um, and they weren't trying to hide what they were doing. They weren't trying to say, okay, this, uh, I, I can tell a better story without having the advantage of the reader understanding what the antecedent story was. So this is very sophisticated cultural engagement. It's not theft. It's a riffing on um, this poetry. So can you talk a little bit about uh, Papias' synoptic hypothesis and also Matthew's likely sources? Um, Papias and his informant, John the Elder, know three Greek Gospels. They do not know Luke and John. They know one gospel that is attributed to the gospel of Mark. And in the left box, you'll see that they imagined that Mark was transcribing and translating the Aramaic preaching of Peter. And because Peter was um, doing a, preach, a preaching event and not writing a history, his material is in a different sequence from Matthew. Matthew, on the other hand, they thought, wrote a Hebrew gospel. He never did, but that was a convenient thing to say that Matthew um, was more authoritative. He wrote in Hebrew, and two inept translators translated it to Greek. One of them is our Matthew. That's um, the arrow in the middle. But then there's a lost translation from them, their perspective that's in with the left uh, arrow. In my view, that likely was the Logoi of Jesus. So when the relationship of Matthew to Mark is in the right-hand square, the three Gospels he knows were Matthew that was informed by Mark, not by um, a lost Hebrew gospel, but um, the the Greek, the lost Greek Matthew, uh, which is the Logoi of Jesus. So Papias is important for this reason, Jacob. He knows three Greek gospels. He wants to attribute one to Mark and two to Matthew, um, whereas those three Greek gospels really are um, sources to Matthew. And Matthew comes at the end of that sequence and not at, at its beginning. So this is the Q plus Papias hypothesis. Um, let's start with Matthew, where we have been. Uh, Matthew has two sources. He has Mark and he has a lost gospel that is similar to Matthew, that is the Logoi of Jesus, the Q document. Papias knows three gospels. He knows two gospels that are related to Matthew, that is Logoi and Matthew, and he knows Mark. Luke says at the beginning of his gospels that he knows that many have written diegesis, that is um, uh, narratives, uh, about Jesus and so on. And th that is, he knows four of them. He knows Papias, he knows the Q document, he knows Matthew, and he knows Mark. And I think this, he, this diagram charts the solution to the synoptic problem.
So now um, I want to shift to looking at the, the actual parallels themselves between the Homeric works and the Gospels and Acts. So we're starting with uh, the Iliad <laughs> and Acts. Um, this is um, but not one of the clearest examples, but it's fine. And you told me that you're being you're getting better at reading Greek. Yes, yeah, so, I would say at least somewhat. Yes. Okay, so um, let's give it a shot. I'll read the Iliad column, and then when I've read a sentence or so, you read its um, its equivalent. Agamemnon convened the Achaean army. Peter addressed one hundred and twenty people. Nestor rose up Anistha, among the Argives and spoke, um, Metepesen. A few days later, Peter arose, Anastas, in the midst of the brothers and spoke. Nestor Apen. told how uh, Arethus was speared in the middle, Meson, and fell backwards, Iptios. Peter told how Judas had died, falling forward, Preness and bursting in the middle. Now, a, a true hero falls backwards because he's facing his opponent in a struggle. A coward falls forward because he's mm -hmm. running away from the conflict. So here Judas is depicted as a coward. And nine men all stood, Anestasan. And they presented, <clears throat> let me read that. And they presented two men, Estasan, to decide which of the nine would face Hector. Nestor ordered them to cast lots. To decide which of the two would replace Judas, Peter proposed the casting of lots. And each man marked his lot, Cleron, and cast it into the helmet of Atreides Agamemnon. And the people prayed and lifted their hands to the gods looking up to broad heaven. Peter's statement in 117 anticipates the casting of lots. Judas won his ministry with the 12 in a lottery of sorts. Elakan, Ton, Cleron, they prayed. Okay, very good. This word Cleron, or Cleron, um, Jacob, is where we get the word clergy for wow. Christians. Um, they're selected by lots in a sense. Okay, one would speak episken like this. Father Zeus, I pray that Ajax may win the lot, Lachin, or the son of uh, Tideus, or the king of gold rich Mycenae himself. So they spoke. That's fascinating. Um, and said, Ipon. You see where we are, Jacob? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I see it. Okay. And said, Epon, Lord, knower of hearts, indicate which of these two men you select to take the place of the service and apostleship that Judas forsook to go to his own place. And the horseman Nestor of Gerenia shook them, and out of the helmet popped the lot, Cleros, and they, uh, that they had wanted, that of Ajax. And they gave them lots, Cleros, and the lot, Cleros, fell for Matthias, and he was enlisted with the eleven apostles. Now, <laughs> those parallels are pretty striking, I think. Oh, yeah, um, I can see. It's, it's hard to weed, weed a lot of that. And one of the things fascinating about it is the depiction of the death of Judas is um, modeled after Papias' criticism of the death of uh, Judas in Matthew um, as a suicide. Um so the, here you have Acts rewriting a gospel and an interpretation of the gospel in Papias 
and does so to a, and embeds it into an imitation of the Iliad. I mean, it really is quite amazing. So it looks like that even in, in certain cases that they'll use, they'll use identical Greek words and sometimes variants of the Greek word, but it's largely and structurally the same is your point. That's exactly right. It's the structure of the argument and it's the sequence of it and it's the function of it. And in some cases you can see um, that it's simply uh, using those images to retell a story. In some cases, it's an, an attempt to say that the story that I'm going to tell you is better than the antecedent. And that's called um, synchrosis in Greek rhetoric. Now, I didn't capture the entire bottom of the page, but I got most of it. You make another point there about Iliad 7 being not only Luke's literary model, but another model came from Papias. How does Luke use Papias here when talking about Judas? Do you have another um, page to show us? I don't have a separate page, but I got most of it there on the bottom. Okay. Um, Matthew's version is that Peter had, uh, uh, Judas had such remorse that he uh, hung himself and uh, the assumption is that he was so remorseful that that would vindicate his uh, his uh, betrayal. Papias knows that people did not like that part of the Gospel of Matthew. And it's likely that Papias attributed it to one of the Greek translators. Be that as it may, he says, no, no, no. Judas survived the hanging and he bought a field uh, with the, the blood money, which is called the field of, of blood. And uh, he was struck dead by God because of a um, heinous um, disease that uh, killed him from the inside. He fall, fell forward and burst in the middle and the field stinks until this very day. Well, that's what Luke does. He, he, he says that uh, Judas did not die by hanging. He fell forward in his own field and burst in the middle. Um, and it's called the field of blood to this day. So you have those echoes. Um, and in order to replace Judas among the 12, he used the uh, lottery scene in Iliad 7. By the way, this, I think, is an important point to bring up. Many people have thought that the gospel authors were um, <laughs> fishermen or um, peasants or even slaves in some cases who may not have had a good education. And they were superstitious and they were just throwing things on the page and they weren't very sophisticated. Um, that's not at all the case. The gospel authors were very sophisticated authors. They weren't the top echelon for sure, um, but they had rhetorical education almost certainly. We can see what they're doing uh, and describe it in terms that come from Greek rhetoric. Now we turn to the slides. Oh, there you have it. Yeah. Uh, Matthew and Papias in the middle and Acts. And the underlining and um, bold indicates um, where Acts is getting some of his content. Some of the content comes from Matthew and some of it comes from Papias. I don't think we need to read it. Um, if you yeah, could scroll no. down, I think we can get the idea just visually. Yeah, there you have it. You can see that uh, Papias is getting some things from Matthew, which is these things are underlined, and some things are in bold, and those are places where uh, Luke is dependent on uh, Papias, but none of that has to do with the lottery, the lottery to replace uh, uh, Judas comes from uh, Iliad 7.
And it's interesting because even here we we see just just like before a lot of the Greek words that you, that you highlight there in brackets, you've got examples of of uh, of them being identical, just like when they use Homer. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Homer, we got another parallel to work on here. This is an amazing yeah. one. And uh, we'll go through it the way we did before. And I don't think we need to read the Greek just to show off. Um, and this one is really helpful in determining um, the priority of canonical Luke over um, Marcion's Luke. Um, because Marcion's Luke has this story in it, but it does not have all of the uh, imitations of the Odyssey that we have in canonical Luke. So um, <laughs> you'd have to say that canonical Luke saw in Marcion's Luke these echoes of Odyssey 24 and then decided to add a few of his own which certainly is not impossible, but it certainly is uh, not very plausible. Plausible. Okay, Odysseus was thought dead, but returned alive. Jesus died, but returned alive. Odysseus came to his father's farm and told himself, I will test my father whether he will recognize me and perceive me with his eyes or not recognize me. Jesus met two disciples on the road outside the city, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Laertes, his father, was sad as he worked his garden. The two disciples were sad as they walked. The stranger, Odysseus, asked questions. A sojourner, Jesus, asked questions. Laertes mourned the death of his son and the violence of the suitors. Cleopas mourned the death of his lord and the violence of the Jewish authorities. Odysseus spoke to his father about himself in the third person, but he still did not recognize him. The risen Jesus spoke to the men about himself in the third person but they still did not recognize him. And, and that parallel is really fascinating, I think, yeah. because both of them are keeping their identity a secret from their um, beloved. Odysseus revealed his identity by bearing his scar. Jesus revealed his identity by breaking bread. And later, of course, he reveals, he bears his wounds. So let's get another page here. Then Laertes recognized his son. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. The two, Odysseus and Laertes, went off to the good house, and when they arrived at the well-situated house, they found Telemachus, the cattleman, and the swineherd carving large quantities of meat. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those with them gathered together. And notice the exact words are used there. Ever, ever. Yes. Um, they were found. When they saw Odysseus and recognized him in their hearts, they just stood there in the halls astonished. As they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace to you. They were startled and terrified. They thought they were seeing a spirit. Then Odysseus chided them with gentle words. Old man, sit down to dinner, and you servants, rid your minds of wonder. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do misgivings arise in your hearts? First consider with your eyes this scar that when I went to Parnassus, a boar, a boar gouged. Uh, I hear him that man of tos ego. See my hand, <laughs> that it is I myself. Uh, one second there. I'm going to have to zoom a little bit. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. 
ego and me, uh, ego and me, otos, handle me and look. A spirit does not have flesh and bone that he see that I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Okay, let's um, do a little game here, Jacob. Let's um, imagine, you don't have to get the slide up. This, the slide that we had from the at the beginning was denial. How would you ever deny the similarities in these two stories? Uh, I mean, I just think that they're so striking. And you can do this over and over and over again with the Gospels. So I don't think denial works. And the twin of denial is suppression. So I think the answer ought to be the proclamation. You know, tell people, look, you've got these uh, imitations. Denial is not going to work. And suppression is unfair. The next thing to do is to say, well, it's uh, an exception. You can, um, you know, occasionally you're going to have something like this happen, but it's not bookish. It's in the culture. That's a recognition scene. We have lots of recognition scenes in Greek tragedy and so on. So you don't have to chuck the whole paradigm of gospel studies to say that, yes, you have this example and whatever. Um, and then you can also then marginalize it to say, because of that, this is not an important um, observation. This is not something that you can make into a general pattern of, um, uh, of composition. So, uh, but I think this is a great example. It's very difficult to get around this and to, to say that it's not uh, intentional. And by the way, it is, here you have a synchrosis. Odysseus comes back, thought dead. He was not dead. And he reveals himself to um, his father. Jesus was dead. And when he reveals himself, he reveals himself as one who um, has his body restored after his death. Um, that, I think, is a, a, a critical observation. I agree. I want to take a look at the parable of the two sons or the prodigal son and how they parallel Homer. <laughs> uh, you're pretty bold on this. Um, I, I think the best way to do it would be, I'm going to read the poem, the story as it appears in Matthew. And right. then we're going to see what uh, Luke has done with it. Uh, this parable, by the way, probably originated in the Q document. And um, it's an allegory to say that um, one should welcome someone who has not been faithful in the past, but if they now come, uh, come along and are faithful, you need to uh, receive them. So a man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. But he replied, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind and went off to work. The father likewise went to the other son who replied, I'm on my way, sir. But he never went out to work. So which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you that tax collectors and prostitutes will precede you in the kingdom of God. What a radical statement that is. Now, if you'll scroll down to the next page, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, an experiment. Uh, I'll read the Logoi part. And you're going to be the word for the voice of Luke throughout. So right. a man had two sons, Anthropos Echitachna, Vio. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. But he replied, I don't want to. And he said, a man had two sons, Anthropos, Tess, 
Ekin duo techna. It's and almost go, exactly, yeah. almost exactly the Greek uh, phrasing. Okay, continue. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the portion of property that falls to me. Okay, I'll I'll read the, the I'll I'll be Luke now. Uh, this is what Luke adds. And the father divvied up his estate, and not much later the younger son gathered it all and left for a distant land, and there squandered his money with wanton living. And no sooner had he squandered everything than a devastating famine uh, gripped the area, and he began to be destitute. So he went and became joined with one of the citizens of that area who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he longed to satisfy his hunger from the carob pods that the swan ate, but no one gave him any. Now, Odysseus' comrades, far from home, morphed into swine, and Circe flung holy berries, acorns, and fruit and cornel for them to eat, what wallowing swine always ate. And by the way, of course, Odysseus left home and during his travels became destitute and was longing to get home. So here we go. But later he changed his mind. But he came to his senses and said, how many of my father's hired help have plenty of bread while I am perishing in a famine? I should go uh, up, go to my father and tell him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired help. And in Logoi, or the Q document, and went off to work. So he arose and went to his father. A different form, but the same verb. And while he was still at some distance from home, his father saw him, took pity on him, rushed off, fell on his neck, and kissed him. To comfort his grieving father, Odysseus, jumping up, kissed and embraced him, and revealed his identity um, as the son thought dead. Here is Homer's account of the father's response. The knees and dear heart of Laertes gave way when he recognized the sure signs that Odysseus showed him. Then he threw his arms around his dear son. Um, why don't you pick it up there? The, and the son told his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Can you get another screen? There we go. And the father uh, said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the finest robe and put it on him. Place a um, ring on his hand. And no, I, I, think we're, I think we missed something. Um, and while we're missing something, anyway, to comfort his grieving father, Odysseus jumping up, kissed and embraced him, and so on. No, I guess you're right. Um, yeah, so similarly, Odysseus proposed that they celebrate his return with a feast. Let's go to your home that sits beside the orchard. Earlier I sent to Lemachus, the cattleman and the swineherd there, and so on. Uh, the two of them went to the beautiful house the swineherd carving large quantities of meat. In the meantime, the house of the Sicilian serving women bathed and anointed great heartedly. Laertes and threw a cloak around him. In Logoi, we find the father likewise went to the other who replied, I'm on my way. Do you but see his older son yeah. was in a field. And when they heard music and dancing, uh, when he approached, they heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what it was all about. Um, so in Logo, the one son never went out. Which of the two did the will of his father? 
But he, the older brother, was furious and did not want to go in. And his father went out and called to him. And he retorted to his father and said, Look, for so many years I am slaving for you and never violated your command. Yet you have never given me such a, as, so much as a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And then in Logoi, truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes will precede the Pharisees into the kingdom of God. But when your son comes, the one who devoured your money with prostitutes, for him you slay the fattened calf. But he said, son, you uh, always are with me and everything that I own is yours. And you too should have partied and rejoiced because this man, your brother, was dead and has revived, was lost and was found. Of course, Odis, uh, <laughs> um, the older brother, the younger brother had not died. So that's metaphorical. Uh, but there you find um, what Luke is doing. He's got the parable of the two sons from the Logoi of Jesus. He sees this as an opportunity to fill it in with details that come from Odyssey 24, Odysseus's return to his father. Um, I think it's very clever. It's another example of the sophistication of these authors. Can you discuss the reverse priority in Mark, inconvenient facts, but a thorough hypothesis? The, the the big issue here, Jacob, um, needs to have a, a transition. Many people have denied the existence of Q because a primary tenant of the International Q Project was to say that Matthew and Luke are both redacting Mark. They share content with each other that they did not derive from Mark. And on the assumption that Luke did not know Matthew, they um, used what is sometimes called oscillating or alternating primitivity. So you compare Matthew and Luke with criteria for determining uh, which is, in these parallels, which is earlier and um, then you prefer that reading as coming from the Q document. The fire hypothesis people argue that there is no Q. And if there, even if there is, it's impossible to reconstruct it because Matthew knows Luke. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke knows Matthew. And therefore the overlaps can be attributed to Luke's use of Matthew and you don't need a lost gospel. Now, that argument would seem to um, have merit. It does to an extent, but it's been used by far hypothesis people and others to uh, dismiss the, uh, the Q, the reconstruction of Q altogether. And I think that that's wrong. Even though Luke, in my opinion, knows Matthew, almost always, not always, Almost always at a pericope level, you can see that Luke knows something in addition to Matthew because he's, even though he's writing later and knows Matthew, he's got more primitive content. That's what's called reverse priority. As stated another way, Matthew was written before Luke. Therefore, you have Matthean priority as the standard. But many times you have Luke with more primitive content that is surprising because of the relative dates, and that is called reversed priority. And it's that reverse priority that has caused uh, havoc with the synoptic problem because people want to say that it, some people have argued, well, that may mean that Luke is earlier. It doesn't. It simply means that he knows a lost source. So that's why it's important. Um, another way of testing this is with doublets. A doublet is something that one finds in Matthew and Luke when they're, in, they're redacting Mark, 
But then they have another version of the same saying, sometimes the same uh, extensive pericope, that has more primitive wording. So this chart that you've got at the bottom of the, uh, the page, you have um, in uh, Matthew a, a use of Mark. That's what the arrow on the right-hand side. So Matthew or Luke is redacting Mark. But there's something as a doublet that is earlier. That's what that uh, angle bracket means. Um, that comes from somewhere else. Now, and by the way, in every case that where we have these doublets, the original Mark inversion is secondary to the earlier one. So where we have in bracket, uh, square brackets, source unknown, you can put Q or the Logoi of Jesus there. In other words, th that version of a saying is more primitive than Mark. It's retained by Matthew or Luke or both. And so you have doublets. You have the Mark version. You have the Matthew and Luke version. And uh, the non-Mark version is earlier. And that phenomenon, Jacob, happens over and over and over again. We also have examples of what are called non-doublets. That is where an author doesn't imitate uh, mark, um, but has something that's similar to it, uh, to what one finds in Mark in a more primitive man way. You also have conflations. That is, Matthew and Luke see similar sayings in their two sources, Mark and Q, and they conflate them. They pull them together in, in, to make a single um, saying. And that way they don't have to have um, doublets. So there are two ways of avoiding doublets. One is you include the non mark version and not the market. Another is you conflate the two. But um, we have uh, over, um, uh, I think, over two dozen examples of doublets where you can, you can see how, how these uh, how Matthew and Luke um, weren't very vigilant in avoiding duplicating content. So we're getting back to the parallels between Odyssey and Luke now. Okay, so we've talked about parallels between um, Mark and Homeric epics. And I've said that before, that you have uh, Luke inversion as well, uh, Luke and imitations as well. One that is somewhat hard to see, but um, it, it has not been noted by any commentator that I know of, is w uh, when Luke is rewriting uh, Jesus' um, rejection at Nazareth. So um, we'll, we'll just read these squares, and um, I'll, I'll make some comments on them at the end, or you can ask some questions of it. Sure. So um, Mark already has a brief version of Jesus coming home to Nazareth or Nazareth and being rejected by his uh, hometown. Luke sees in that... Um, parallels to Telemachus being rejected by his neighbors in Ithaca. And so he expands on um, the Mark inversion by loading it up with Homeric stuff. So let's give this a shot. Telemachus stood in the center of the assembly and a herald put the staff in his hand. And rose up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now, the staff in the Odyssey is a token of authority. And, of course, in the synagogue, a scroll is a token of authority. I mean, it, it carries authority. The biblical citation 
um, in Luke comes from Isaiah. So um, we'll skip that. Telemachus boldly set forth his intentions of ousting the suitors and freeing his household. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to send away free the oppressed, to, pro to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Telemachus, in disgust, tossed the staff to the ground. And after closing the scroll and handing it to the assistant, he sat down. And all, Pontus, the people, gazed at him when he arrived. The eyes of all, Pontus, in the synagogue, were gazing at him. Helithyrses, the prophet, reminded the suitors of his prophecy long ago, that Odysseus would return and liberate his house. And now all these things are being fulfilled. And he began to tell them, this writing is fulfilled in your ears today. Now at this point, Luke returns to redacting Logoi. So the lost gospel says, and many people on hearing were stunned and said, where did this fe fellow get his wisdom and miracles? Is this not a son of Joseph? And everyone spoke well of him, amazed at the gracious words that issued from his mouth, and said, Is this man not a son of Joseph? But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own homeland, um, and so on. But he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is acceptable in his own homeland. Luke develops the theme of Jesus's rejection by his own people by appealing to examples from the miracle work of Elijah and Elisha. And everyone in the synagogue was filled with wrath when they heard these things. Penelope's suitors similarly were outraged when they realized that Telemachus had sailed off to Pelos to seek information about um, his father from Nestor. So we're back to the Odyssey, but now in book four. The suitors laid wait on a rocky island for Telemachus's return so that they could kill him away from the city. And they rose up, threw him out of the city, and led him to the brow of a mountain on which their city was built to throw him off the, pre uh, the precipice. In book 15, however, Telemachus avoided their, avoids their ambush um, thanks to Athena. But he passed through their midst and left. The density sequence and distinctiveness of these parallels, parallels surely qualifies for a mimetic connection. Mm. Yep. Those are, again, quite striking, I think. Now we're looking at the parallels between the Homeric hymn to Dionysus and Luke. Um, Jacob, I think we can do this one. It's it's not particularly long, but uh, I think it'd be good for us then to um, have a conversation sure. about what this means. And uh, because we could do this for two days, there are so many yeah. parallels. Um Let's do you have the page just before this, or is this the beginning of your? I don't think I have the page photograph before this. No, no, let's not worry about it then. Um, I can uh, tell you what's going on in the Homeric hymn, and then we'll look at the parallels. The Homeric hymn to Dionysus. Um, is about pirates. It's a very famous story, by the way, influenced art as well. Um, Dionysus is disguised as a young man of royalty, and he's alone on the shore. And the pirates say, hey, he's alone. He looks like he's from royalty. Uh, let's kidnap him. And so they go and kidnap him and they go back, back out to sea uh, perhaps to, uh, to to use him to, to for for wealth or to, as a slave or whatever, and all of a sudden there are miracles aboard the ship. The mast turns into a grapevine. 
there's a lion and a bear on the ship. And the pirates are terrified. And they all jump, all but one, jump into the brine and become dolphins. But there's one helmsman who says, oh, you must be a deity. No one can do this except for you. And Dionysus spares him. And so that's the basically the story. So let's go back to the slide and we'll, uh, we'll see how that works. Um, the helmsman understood he's not like mortal men, but like the gods. When Simon Peter saw Edom, this he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Okay, and then go further. Or is that it? Oh, amazement uh, overtook all the sailors when they saw all of this. Only the helmsman was spared from um, metamorphizing into a dolphin. Astonishment overtook him and all who were with him at the catch of fish. They hauled in. Likewise, Jacob and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon. Dionysus said, take good courage. You have found favor in my heart. I am loud crying Dionysus. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching people. Dionysus turned soldiers into fish. Jesus turned sailors into fishermen for people. A slick synquisis. Whereas Mark and Matthew narrated no miracles that have could have caused the four fishermen to follow Jesus, Luke made up for it in, uh, spectacularly thanks to an anonymous Greek poet. Um, so I think that's enough. There's an example of another imitation of this by Lucian, but um, I think that's uh, enough for now. I think that gives us something to talk about. Um, I actually, I, I'm not looking for, for compliments, Jacob. Um, but you're one of the few people so far that has read, must the synoptics remain a problem? And I'm very proud of it. But at this point, the, the, the sales are almost non-existent. There are no reviews in Amazon. I mentioned earlier, it's hard for people to get a hold of it. Uh, but I'm really quite proud of it. Can you respond to your own reading of it? Did it make sense to you? I uh, know it's highly technical. There's no doubt about it. And um, you're to be credited for trying to learn some Greek in order to make more sense of it. But what what was your experience in reading it? I think it's a fascinating collection of research that, that you've done, um, of the work that you've put into this in prior books. Um, because it gives it gives the reader the very good idea of what you're talking about. And I think in a way you make it easy to do so, even though it is still it still comes out as very technical. And I doubt that can be helped. And I mean that in a complimentary way. Um, yeah. It sounds like to me that when based on uh, uh, the way we want to understand Mark and priority, I guess in this situation, Luke's use of Mark, when Luke uses Mark, it sounds like there are times he elaborates and he adds additional Homeric material. Yes, he does. That Mark did not add. When Luke... And, and, and think of the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles is full of Homeric imitation. Yeah. And so Luke is conflating Homeric material he finds in Mark with Homeric material he finds in Homer. And I think one can assume what I think should probably be obvious that Luke is aware <coughs> uh, that Mark is using Homer. So he recognizes the Homeric parallels to Mark. And I think that helped him in his, as, a, as a guidance to elaborate as he conflates Mark and the Logoi and Homer together, as I think you have shown many examples of that. Well, here's a fascinating piece of that, Jacob. 
When Mark tells the story of the death of Jesus, his model is the death of Hector at the end of the Iliad. Luke does not like what Mark does with the death of Jesus. But he knows what Mark has done. How can I say that? Because he has two places in preparation for the, uh, the death of Jesus where he is imitating passages at the beginning of Iliad 22, the book where Homer talks about the death of Hector. One is the lament of um, the fall of Jerusalem by Priam, Hector's father, and the other is the exposure of the breast of Hecuba, appealing to Hector not to fight. And um, you have um, such predictions in Luke. So he's adding to the Markan story. But his version of the death of Jesus is um, not about a loser, but about an intentional philosophical death, namely the death of Socrates in Plato's Phaedo. And here you have him forgiving his executioners. Here you have him um, accept that um, uh, talking to the uh, righteous thief that you're going to be um, in paradise with me um, uh, immediately, and not just the a, 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 a kingdom on earth. You have um, Pilate declaring Jesus to be innocent three times. Um, that's what you have in the Apologies by, uh, by Plato and Xenophon. The charges against Jesus are similar to those as the, the charges against uh, Socrates, and only in Luke, that is, he's disturbing the people, and he's not worshiping the gods of, uh, of the public. Um, the, the parallels go on and on. So in this case, Mark, uh, Luke sees what Mark has done in imitating um, Iliad 22. He also is going to uh, imitate, knows that Mark has imitated uh, Iliad 24, the burial effector. But he, he doesn't like it very much because he wants to make Jesus more philosophical. And so now uh, the death of Jesus is similar to the death of uh, Socrates. And so now you no longer have imitations of poetry. You have imitations of a very, very famous philosophical death, probably the most important one in, uh, in Greek culture. So I know we don't have much more time. Shall we go for shall we go through a couple of more examples, or do you want to continue in part two another time? Oh, let's do a part two. Okay. Yeah, because there's definitely more slides there. Good. Uh, we were unable to get through today, but I think we had a lot of fun here. This was a blast. Um, let's put up a couple of uh, questions. So first we got Arthur. Thank you for becoming a member. Appreciate it. Myth Vision Podcast. Eric Lambert says, Dennis is the man. I agree, Derek. He certainly is. JC, thank you for your super chat. Has Dr. McDonald looked into how Josephus fits in the puzzle, Luke Axe? Steve Mason has argued for antiquities as a source, too. Thank you to you both. You no, I'm assuming JC doesn't mean Jesus Christ. Uh, otherwise, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be a little uh, intimidated. No, JC, your question is right on target. I um, am a big fan of what Steve Martin, uh, Steve Mason has done with the antiquities. Um, and uh, I am sure that the Acts of the Apostles is heavily indebted um, to Josephus and the antiquities. Um, but I want to add something to Steve Mason that he toys with but doesn't develop as much as I'd like to see. And that is, if Luke knew the antiquities, one of the books in the antiquities he likely knew was book 18. 
Book 18 is where you have this contested uh, testimonium Flavianum, where Josephus is dissing on Christians and their leader, uh, Jesus, who was crucified by Pilate, um, probably because he was in, uh, in not please, making friends with the right people. Now, if Luke knew that passage in Josephus, why doesn't he challenge it? He does. He does in the gospel and he does in the Acts of the Apostles. And he's going after that depiction in Josephus of Jesus as a troublemaker. And, be, and by the way, Josephus lists Jesus among troublemakers. At the end of the story uh, the, of his what he says about um, Jesus, it says, and let me tell you about another outrage. So whatever Jesus did, it was outrageous for Josephus. Now, what does, um, I've talked just a moment ago about um, the, the death of Jesus in the gospel as being like that of Socrates. Socrates was accused of troubling the people and not believing the deities of Athens. Um, so he was a troublemaker. And in his trial, the point is made frequently that he is a uh, dikos. He is righteous. He is, his uh, punishment is being unfair because he is not outrageous. But in Acts 24, Paul has to deal with the same charges by this fellow who's a lawyer uh, uh, convicting him of being uh, a troublemaker, a ringleader of the Nazarenes. And he's um, uh, violating the temple, and this is in the, his hearing before Felix. And so what does Paul say? He said, hey, wait, wait, wait. You've got it all wrong. I believe in everything in the law and the prophets. Well, that wasn't true for Jesus. But anyway, um, so he, he's saying he's a faithful Jew. And by the way, I was in the temple myself. In a, in a rite of purification, and there wasn't a tumult, and there wasn't an uproar. He's saying, um, t you got it wrong, Josephus. Um, and I've written this up in uh, a couple of uh, books that they get tucked away and never cited. But I think uh, Steve Mason is right, that Josephus had derogatory things to say about uh, Jesus in book 18. And uh, later Christians couldn't hack it. And so they uh, made it into a, uh, a, 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 they Christianized it. Um, Luke didn't have that luxury. He read it as being a critique of Jesus and his followers. And uh, Paul was going to set it right. So it's not just that uh, Luke is using Josephus. To some extent, Luke is arguing with Josephus. And uh, I think that is really a fascinating spin on this uh, this issue. The other thing that it does, and um, it, it's, it says that mythicists are wrong in saying there is no external evidence of the historical Jesus. Josephus certainly is a witness to a historical Jesus, and he's not complimentary. He's arguing that Jesus is a troublemaker and, and, and probably had crucifixion coming to him. We got another super chat. This will be the last one that I take for today. Jesus Tales, thank you for your super chat. Why not use the Bible as a source as well as Greek myths? Jesus follows Jesus non, Jesus Jehozadak, and Elisha. Uh, Jesus tales, that's a good question, and I wouldn't deny that there um, aren't Greek myths here as well. So, for example, the Logoi of Jesus is interested in making Jesus an alternative Moses, who's more compassionate. Um, Luke has the, the healing of the uh, widow's son at Nain, which surely is a replication of the, an El the Elijah-Elisha uh, cycles. So um, you, you have also the uh, Methayan nativity uh, 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 annunciations, and those are coming out of 
um, out of Genesis. So you certainly have um, th these myths that come from the Jewish world. Now, some would say that the myths, the Jewish myths themselves come out of ancient Greek uh, lore. Um, I think that's more difficult to establish. But um, we have cultural hybridity in the, the New Testament. And we've been attentive to the Jewish side. We've not been sufficiently attentive to the Greek side, in my view. But it's a very good question. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dennis. Well, thank you, Jacob. All the best. I hope we can do this again. Yeah, definitely. We'll make it soon. Um, so reminder, everybody, check out the book in the description and in the pinned comment below. I'll see everybody later. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.